What's up everybody, Mike Lazarecki here, and uh, today I decided to take you guys out into the field and uh, talk about one of my favorite photography techniques, and that is basically called the Bokarama or Brenizer method, and uh, yeah, let's get into that. Uh, sometimes it's called a bokeh panorama. Um, for me, I just kind of look at it as a way of sort of simulating uh, the look of medium format film from the standpoint of focal length and depth of field. So uh, yeah, the way this works is that basically you take a whole bunch of photos and you stitch them together like you would with a panorama. So rather than doing a panorama that goes just across your image, you would actually do a panorama that's more like a grid where you've got multiple images, both laterally and vertically. So to start with, let's uh, see if we can find a cool composition and then we'll go over the technique in general. Whew. Okay, so the other thing I wanna make mention of is uh, just basically a quick apology. It is like super windy out here today and I just wanted to apologize in advance uh, because the audio could end up being kind of crappy in this video because of how windy it is. So sorry about that in advance if it gets real bad. Okay, so I think I found the first composition that I'm going to try to do the Brenizer method on uh, for this video anyway. Um, and I will turn around and show you here real quick. And yeah, so that kind of lone tree right there. I think what I want to do is uh, set this up to shoot uh, that tree and that landscape type shot in order to try to accentuate the landscape and make it look bigger. Okay, so there's a couple of things that you want to try to keep in mind when you're shooting this Brenizer method thing. So the first of those things is you want to make sure that no matter what your camera settings are set to, you want all of your focus settings and your aperture settings and your exposure settings to all be set to manual. That way you can make sure that every one of those photos that are in that grid end up being a consistent exposure that way you don't end up with any kind of weird dark spots or bright spots within the stitched image when you're all done. Also, when it comes to focal length, I find that using a little bit longer focal length and a wider aperture tends to end up looking a little bit better with this kind of shot. Previously, I've used this method using like an 85 millimeter at 1.8 with an ND filter on it. So today I'm going to be shooting on the Tamron 70 to 180 and I'm going to try to keep it around that 2.8 mark. And then in order to keep my exposure consistent, rather than using an ND filter, I'm going to actually shoot at a higher shutter speed. That way I can make sure that all the details are in real crisp focus and there's not too much motion blur since we have all this wind. So another important thing you want to keep in mind with this photography method is that since you are stitching a whole bunch of photos together, it's kind of important that if you have a subject like a person or maybe a tree that is being affected by, I don't know, a bunch of wind, for example, you generally want to try to shoot that subject first in your frame and then shoot the rest of the images around it. And it might work better when you do that to shoot that center frame and then work concentrically outward for your photo in order to cover all the ground that you want to cover. This way you don't miss the action that you're trying to capture in the first place and then you're still able to capture that really cool image. So the Boca Pano or Boca Panorama or also known as the Brenizer method is known as the Brenizer method because of a guy named Ryan Brenizer who popularized it by using it for high-end wedding photography and portrait photography in order to take advantage of the unique aesthetic that it gives those photos. Okay, so I think I got what I wanted out of this particular shot with this tree. So I think I'm gonna kind of move along and uh, kind of head down this path that's behind me and see if I can make it over to, there's, I know there's a spot over here that's got a lake and kind of a cool dock and also uh, a little forested area. So maybe I can find some cool compositions in there. And yeah, so let's do that. So yeah, the other thing that makes me really love this kind of photography, and especially the way that I'm doing it today, is that uh, it gets me outdoors. I'm a big fan of the outdoors and outdoor recreation, hiking and things like that. So it gets me back outside and it also brings me back to my roots with landscape photography, which is really where I got my start learning all of this stuff. 
you know, I started shooting weddings with my dad, but aside from that, where I really got to learn how to use the camera settings was by shooting outdoor stuff, landscapes and animals and things like that. And it gave me an opportunity to test out what would this setting do if I change it. So, you know, if you're just kind of starting out, take your camera outside, mess with the settings, see what you can come up with. And it's one of the best ways to learn because a lot of your subjects outside, I mean, animals are gonna move around, but a lot of your subjects outside, like landscapes and things like that, they're not gonna move around on you. So you have an opportunity to try different things and see how it affects your image. So, but yeah, man, I love being out here doing a little bit of walking and, you know, landscape photography. It's just fun. So yeah, one of the things that I wanna show you while I'm standing here at this dock is actually what the difference between a normal photo shot on a wide lens and a photo shot using this Brenizer method would actually look like. So you're gonna see the difference in the feeling of the stitched image versus just the wide image. So I'm gonna take a shot of this dock at about 17 millimeters and then I'm gonna turn around and take a shot using that longer lens and stitch the photo together and you can see what the differences are. Obviously another big benefit to this style of shooting is that you also end up with an enormous resolution file. I'm shooting on the Sony a7R 3 which is a 42.3 megapixel camera, and if I'm stacking several images together, it's not difficult to see an image come out that is well over 100 megapixels. All right, so I think we've probably shot enough of the Brenizer method for today. Let's uh, head back to the office, and I'll show you how to edit these together. Okay, so welcome back to the office. It's obviously been a couple of days since I recorded that, so I didn't have a chance to record this part before, but uh, yeah, well, let's get into it now. So once you have your photos offloaded from your camera onto your computer, now it's time to work on trying to stitch those photos together into one bigger photo. So I'm gonna show you how to do this in Adobe Lightroom, uh, but most of the time you should have an option to do this in other photo editors if you're using something like Affinity Photo. I know for a fact that their panorama stitching works excellent. It sometimes works even better than Adobe Lightroom, but in this instance, we're gonna use Lightroom because I think that's what most people are gonna use for this kind of thing. So let's hop over into the computer and get started. So once you get into Adobe Lightroom, go ahead and make yourself a collection over here and import your photos for whatever panorama you're looking to uh, go ahead and stitch. And in this case, we have 15 photos from our outing the other day. So in order to stitch this together into one of those bokeh panos, what we want to do is select the first one, hold down shift and select the last one, thereby allowing us to select all of them in the collection. We're going to right click and go to photo merge and click on panorama. Now, this goes through and processes all the photos in that collection and then it shows you the stitch result as a preview here and it shows you can see all 15 images were successfully merged. Now these projection methods will give you a slightly different look. I would say from a creative standpoint, once it's done stitching them, go ahead and cycle through these and see which composition you like the best. Personally, I'm kind of feeling this spherical one, but it uh, depends on what kind of photo you're looking to uh, put together here. So let's just quickly take a look at the controls in this dialog box. As you can see here, auto crop and auto settings are already kind of pre-selected for us. And I find that that for simplicity's sake works really, really well. If you uncheck auto crop, you can see that these are the edges of the individual photos that we took, which make up this bigger image. So one little piece of advice would be to keep in mind how many images you're shooting per panorama because once you hit this merge button down here, it certainly can take a very long time to process. This auto settings checkbox actually just kind of puts, uh, you know, some automatic color adjustments onto the photo. If it looks good, I say go ahead and leave it. It still spits this out as a DNG, so you can get away with an awful lot of editing with these photos when they're done. Now this fill edges checkbox, if you uncheck the auto crop and then you click on fill edges, what it's gonna do is artificially try to fill in this stuff around the edges, which is cool. But the problem is that if you kind of look closely, you can see these seams. So I don't really recommend using that unless it's on a photo that you don't think is going to have too much close scrutiny. So I usually leave that unchecked and I leave auto crop turned back on. I will turn off auto crop just to kind of see if there's a different 
crop that I want to do manually, but most of the time Lightroom does a pretty good job of getting the majority of the image in there. So but we've gone through that. Uh, boundary warp basically just sort of works with the different distortion that can be created by different lenses and trying to shoot this method. You can really see what it's doing if you uncheck the auto crop and go ahead and mess with that slider. You can see that it's trying to just change the distortion to kind of clean up those edges. So let's go ahead and click on merge and it's going to take a few minutes to go ahead and uh, create that panorama image for you. The more images you have in that Brenizer photo, the longer it will take to process. And it also is going to depend on the power and speed of your computer and image processor. Um, if you've got a real high-end graphics card, this might take no time at all. I have a pretty decent setup. I run an RTX 2070 in my machine, and you can see how long it's taking here for that. So uh, we'll just go ahead and fast forward here to uh, when this is done. All right, so as you can see here, we now have our Brenizer method style photo. And you can see where this kind of creates a really interesting type of compression and it just gives it a different type of look, which is super cool. Now, just to give you an idea of how large an image we just created, if we hop over into our metadata and scroll down, you see after the crop, it's just under 12,000 by just over 22,000 pixels. That's just about a 262 megapixel image, which is crazy. But so realistically, you could print this huge and still have incredible detail. So if we kick over into the develop tab and I can toss on one of my own personal presets here and it just kind of gives me this cool semi film look. And uh, yeah, we can kind of mess with some of the, the settings here and get her dialed in. And then you just export your photo and post it to Instagram and get tons and tons of likes. So good times. So as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. Consider subscribing and I will see you guys next week.